All right, welcome students to our career speaker series. We are gonna get started in just a few minutes, but before we start, I'm gonna play a short video that was made by Dallas IC's Communications Department for Hispanic Heritage Month. So make sure that your sound's working and that you can see everything clearly, and we are going to get started. I am from New York City. I was born in the Bronx, a uh, family of four. I have one older sister. Both my parents are Puerto Rican. Being from the Bronx, really everybody was Puerto Rican, you know? It was a culture shock coming from the Bronx to Garland. As a young man, identifying as a Puerto Rican, Hispanic, I didn't have to. That's all I saw around me. I mean, we knew of other races and they were around, but it didn't matter. We were the dominant culture around and um, I didn't have to identify or learn anything. It wasn't until I moved to Texas where I kind of had to start processing how did I want to be perceived? How did I want to explain who I was? What was I proud about? You know, that's when I really had to pay attention. We serve a multiracial population. And I think the important thing is just seeing someone that looks like them in a position of a principalship. And it's two ways. The district supports me, they trust me, and, and that gives the community, you know, buy-in. Like, hey, you know, they, they believe in this guy, he looks like us. And I think they appreciate that. You know, I think our community looks forward to seeing people that looks like them. Our grandparents had a lot of hope, you know, and then we started dreaming, and now my kids have goals. You know, so I think there's been some progression from hope. Now we are in positions of principalship, we're congressmen and representatives and doctors and lawyers. Hope is a fantastic word. I mean, hope is still there. There are still things um, that hope works with. The Hispanic culture, whether you're, you know, again, you're from Spain, Mexicano, Puerto Rican, you know, you're Latinx, Chicano, we tend to all be deep rooted into our families. That's the basis of the, of the Hispanic culture. The Latino culture is the family, and then you get the food and the music, you know. But that one piece is, is how we're connected, you know, to each other. And as we get older, my kids get older, you know, trying to pass that culture down to them. The language is important and, and the food, you know, really the recipes, you know, trying to perfect what my grandmother made, you know, for birthdays and Thanksgiving and, and trying to get it right. It's a way of honoring them, even though they're not here anymore. And ask my mother and my father, you know, for more information too, not just about food, but how was it when you were younger? Where exactly did you live? And I've been really lucky to try to bridge that gap for myself and for my kids. Welcome to Dallas ISD's Career Speaker Series. I'm Sarah Pettis and I work for Dallas ISD's Racial Equity Office. Before I go any further, I want to ask Damaris to explain our interpretation functions today. Hola estudiantes, buenos días. Uh, si deseas escuchar esta presentación en español, puedes seleccionar la opción en español en la parte inferior derecha de la pantalla El Mundo. Si por algún motivo no escuchas al intérprete, regresa al inglés y vuelve a intentar la opción en español. Si aún no funciona, a favor de avisarnos en el chat. Gracias. Thank you, Damaris. Okay, um, so today's webinar is being recorded and will be available in coming weeks on Dallas ISD's YouTube channel. The link will be posted on the Racial Equity Office's website. During the webinar today, your camera and microphone have been disabled, but you will still be able to participate using the Q&A feature. So on the Q&A feature, it is down at the bottom of your screen and there are two speech bubbles next to each other. If you click this button, you'll be able to type in a question for our panelists to answer. 
So finally, I want to tell you about the prizes that you'll be able to win. The prizes are for 10 of the people who registered and attended the webinar today. They will win a book from one of our authors that we featured at our virtual author visit on the first day of Hispanic Heritage Month. And then 10, the first 10 people who fill out the event survey at the end will also receive a book from one of those authors. So you're going to have 20 winners today and one of them could be you. All right, so next on to our event. The Career Speaker Series is truly one of our most popular events during our Heritage Month programming. Students get the opportunity to hear from career, from professionals in all different careers around Dallas. And we get to ask them questions about their career pathways. So today I'm joined by a fantastic panel who I'm sure you are going to be excited to hear from. Our first great guest is Andres Franco, who is one of our own. Andres was born and raised here in Dallas. And after graduating from high school at the career of business and management at Townview Center, he attended university in Michigan and earned his, business, his bachelor's degree in finance and international business. After he graduated from college, he started to work for a mortgage company and moved to Arizona to expand the company's bilingual department. In 2018, he moved back here to Texas. He earned his master's degree in education and now he is working towards his PhD in adult learning and leadership, all the while working full time for Mr. Cooper Mortgage Company. In his free time, Andres enjoys running on the Katy Trail and spending time with his rescue kitten and partner. And we did see the rescue kitten just a little bit ago, so maybe the kitten will make another appearance. Um, our second guest today is Rudy Rodriguez. Rudy has lived all around the United States, was, but was born here in Texas. He graduated from Texas A&M and went to Harvard Law School. Afterwards, he came back here to Dallas and he has practiced law in small and large Dallas law firms. He's worked for American Airlines and JCPenney, and now he works for a company that I know a lot of you have heard of, but you probably don't know the name of this company. He is the chief legal and human resources officer and corporate secretary at CEC Entertainment. So for more than 40 years, CEC Entertainment has been entertaining all of us around the country and around the world um, in the form of Chuck E. Cheese and Peter Piper Pizza. So I know you guys have heard of those companies. Uh, Rudy lives here in Dallas with his wife, Stacy, and they have two grown children. So welcome to you both. Thank you so much for coming. Look, and he doesn't have a cat, but Rudy has a mouse. So not friends. <laughs> <laughs> Not friends, but it'll be okay. I'm sure, Andres, how does your cat feel about Chuck E. Cheese? Um, you know what? Haven't introduced her to the Chuck E. Cheese idea just yet. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. maybe a little too young, but we'll get her there eventually. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, they'll be friends one day. Yeah. There we go. That's the plan. Well, welcome to both of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you Thank for having you. us here. Yeah. So, Andres, I would like to start with you. What is your favorite memory of being here with us in Dallas ISD? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So as you mentioned, right, I actually attended DISD schools. Um, I went to Longfellow Career Academy, and then I went to Townview Magnet Center, where I went to the School of Business and Management. And honestly, my best memories are just the opportunities that were presented to us as kids in the Dallas area, right? Um, I feel like a lot of the times, you know, being a person from the city or a kid in the city, you don't realize the opportunities that are really presented to you. Um, you think that there's a lot of opportunities that lack because you're an inner city kid, right? Um, but you have to seek those opportunities out. So one thing that I, that I appreciate is that you know, despite of, you know, the circumstances that were presented, there were a lot of opportunities that were presented to us as kids. Um, I learned how to open my first checking account when I was 
14 years old, right? Um, and I maintained that checking account. I was taught how to, you know, how the whole process worked as a teller and, you know, how to keep a checking book. Um, so it was, it was very interesting to just see the opportunities that we thought aren't presented to us that are, that are really always, always there. I love that. Yeah, I think that the district tries really hard to expand those opportunities to all of the students. So I love that you said that. Um, okay, so Rudy, I have kind of a similar question for you. You moved like you were born here in Texas, but I know you lived in New Mexico, you lived in Michigan. Like what were some of the things like the benefits of being able to go to schools all around the country when you were growing up? Uh, well, and I would also and thank you again for having me, but I would also start by saying that uh, I have two kids and my oldest uh, child is uh, now 25, but she graduated from Booker T. Washington High School oh. for the performing visual arts. She was in the theater group and she absolutely loved it and we loved it uh, for her. She it's got a great, a great education there. And she went on to the University of North Texas, got a degree in radio, TV, film, and now she's working in Hollywood um, oh. with, uh, you know, uh, in movie companies. So she's really uh, gotten a lot out of her education here from BISD. And so we're very proud to be Dallas ISD parents. Oh, that's um, wonderful. As, yes. Uh, as far as my own uh, journey, um, well, I was able to um, attend different schools, as you said, uh, throughout my elementary school. In fact, um, I have figured it out. I was in a different school every grade uh, of elementary school, first, second, third, all the way through sixth grade. Uh, just because my, my parents were moving, uh, my father was in, an educator and he was getting college degrees himself and we were following his, his path. Um, and I learned uh, about, you know, I don't remember Michigan. I was there when I was two or three years old. <laughs> I do remember living in Fort Worth and in, and in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, those were really great. I started school in Fort Worth in their bilingual program the first year that it existed. My father led yeah. that program. And so, uh, you know, education and bilingual education is, has been a huge part of our family's experience um, all the way from the beginnings of the program in the early 1970s. I'm very old. Um, so, <laughs> I think we're the same uh, age, Rudy. So. <laughs> we're only kind of old. Yeah. You look much younger. <laughs> you are very, you've aged much uh, more gracefully than I Thank have. You. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I read that your parents, there's a school named after both of your parents in Denton right. because of all of the work they did in Denton ISD, like towards right. education. Um, right. What, like when you have that type of a legacy, like what do you want to be able to leave like to your children at the end of your career? Like what do you want people to have known you for? Right. Well, thank you. I, um, yeah, I'm very proud of my parents. And, uh, and as you said, they um, were very involved in education. They're now retired, but they're still involved in community uh, uh, activities and, and, and boards and, and things. My father was the first uh, Hispanic Latino um, elected to the Denton ISD school board and uh, has many you know, years of service to the district there, as well as to his universities. He taught at both universities in Denton, Texas Women's University for 25 years and University of North Texas for another five years. So he's uh, deeply into education and he's still instilled in us a deep um, respect for and love of education. So it was always known in our family that we would go to college. It was just a matter of where. Um, and uh, as far as what uh, uh, I am hoping that my children uh, take from me and that I leave to them is the same kind of um, love of education, always be a lifelong learner, uh, always find things to uh, uh, occupy your brain and, and, and expand your horizons, and also be very um, proud of our own heritage as Hispanics. And, uh, they, they both are, um, they, uh, we didn't speak a lot of Spanish when my kids were growing up in the house, but they both learned it through school and through um, my parents teaching them. And they were, there's, there's Kitty. Um, 
I'm sorry. He's a little scared. He's a little scared. Yeah, Chuck E. Um, Cheese is quaking. Yes. <laughs> but um, but they they love that. And my son is a, a senior in college now, and he's a Spanish minor. My oh, daughter cool. was a Spanish minor, and it's very important to me that they they continue their studies in Spanish and that they use it in their jobs. Uh, and that they use it to uh, give back to the community. And they both have started doing that already. Um, just that we are not, um, you know, islands here. We are here to, uh, uh, we're a part of a community. Uh, nobody gets where they are on their own. Uh, we all count on people. And once we have achieved certain success in life, we need to be there to pull people up um, and help them as well. I love that. I think that's one of the most important things to help people understand that we don't stop learning. Like when we stop learning, we stop growing, we stop progressing. It's important to always be seeking after that. Yeah. So Andres, like that leads perfectly into what you study. <laughs> you're, go, you're getting your PhD in adult learning, but you also like something Rudy said about being able to use Spanish, like that was what like jumpstarted your career right out of college was being able to be use your Spanish, right? Yeah, absolutely. So once I graduated college, I started my career in mortgage banking and that was fantastic. I worked in Detroit for maybe a couple of months uh, and then they asked for volunteers to move out to the Arizona location to expand their bilingual department. And that was kind of my opportunity to jump ship one, try something new, but then two, use the skills that you know I had been embedded with as a child um, to do something for the community. Um, so I took the opportunity and I went to the Arizona location to expand their bilingual department. And it was a great opportunity. And one thing that I learned was that there was a lack of help for the Hispanic community, especially when it came to the mortgage or the finance business, right? Um, a lot of people that are of Hispanic descent don't really understand um, you know, finances to an extended degree, right? And so being able to, you know, develop the translations and develop the language to be able to properly explain that to a customer, right, um, was something that was very close and dear to me, right? Because I, I was able to then give something in return. So in a way I was, I was giving back to the community, right? Indirectly, right? By being able to create curriculum and create scripting and create verbiage um, that people that were bilingual or just, you know, just Spanish speakers were able mm -hmm. to understand um, was a huge win for not just the company, but for me as well. Yeah, I think that's like really an amazing thing. And both of you have talked about like there are still these opportunities, like we talk about, oh, we're, you know, in the 21st century, there are still these opportunities to be the first person to open up doors to other people being able to move forward in their lives and progress and partake of all of the things that, that other people have offered to them and being able to open that up through like edu bilingual education, or through programming um, in the workplace. That's really, um, I think that's really important and, and inspiring that there's something we can still do to help people. Yeah, I love that. Okay, um, I have another question for you guys. Um, what do you think was the best advice someone gave you while you were growing up about your career. So maybe even while you were in school, but um, like Rudy, I know you changed your, de your degree midway and, um, and Andres, you're like merging your degrees to do something. Yeah. So um, what do you think was the best advice someone shared with you? Andres, you want to start? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take this one first. So I think uh, the biggest advice was just believe in yourself. And I know that sounds super cliche. I know it sounds super, super cliche. It's so cheesy, right? We hear it all the time, but quite honestly, no one's gonna believe in yourself more than you. You know, no one's gonna believe in yourself more than you're gonna believe in yourself. And, you know, it, it's hard to realize sometimes, especially when you're growing up, especially when you're in school, you feel like all odds are stacked against you, right? Um, that, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck in this, in this, 
just pattern, right? Um, it seems but like it lasts for a long it time. Does. Yeah. <laughs> it really does. But here's what I will tell you guys is I was not the best at math. <laughs> I, 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 I will be honest. I was not the best at math, not the best <laughs> at math, but I wanted to get a business degree. I wanted to study finance and I challenged myself, right? I was like, okay, I know that I'm not good at math. Um, I know that I'm struggling with like my algebra classes, my pre-cal classes, right? But I'm not going to let this stop me from fulfilling my dreams. And I think a lot of the times what we do is we let these small obstacles get in our way of continuing our path forward, right? And we can't allow ourselves to do that, especially when we're in an age where we're really developing and growing, right? Because at, at that point in time, we're just doing ourselves uh, a disservice, right? So you just kind of have to keep pulling yourself out of that, out of that hole, right? Um, and just believing yourself to keep going. And ultimately, you know, I ended up getting my bachelor's degree in three years, and I double majored in finance and international business, right? And then I ended up working for the mortgage industry, right, in a financial sector. And it was something that I never saw myself doing, right? It got to a point where I was actually helping people with their finances, right? One of their biggest investments, which is their home, right? Yes, which and is math. Home. It and, and math, right? Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> math, right? <laughs> right? And that was something that I never thought I could do. And, and I'll be honest, you know, there were some times where just even you know, th there were people that saw that I wasn't good at math that told me, hey, maybe you should pick a different career. Maybe you shouldn't go and study business, right? We can't let those voices silence your dreams or the dream that you want to pursue. Um, and so, like I said earlier on, right, I know that it sounds really corny. I know it sounds cheesy when I say believe in yourself, but I truly, truly mean it. It really goes a long way when you not only believe in yourself, but the dream that you want to pursue. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that. You have to hold on to it because things will be hard and challenges will come Always. and you just have to hold on to this is important to me. And I think that I can do it. Yeah. yeah. Silence the negativity. I will say. Yeah. Silence. Might as well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> might as well. And my own story is, is very similar. I, I don't, uh, it, it's, it's, I'm glad I let Andres go first because he was able to say it very much better than I can, but I, I, uh, you know, when I was uh, in college and decided to go to law school, um, the counselor uh, at the college um, was telling all of the students there at the university that if you want to go to law school, you really need to just stay in Texas. There is, you know, it's very difficult for us to um, get into um, you know, from, from these Texas schools to get into the schools outside the state of Texas. So, Let's just focus our search there, and um, and, and that's being realistic, and and really try to get all of us to believe um, that we needed, you know, to limit ourselves. Um, uh, but uh, we, um, uh, but but my father uh, advised me not to limit myself like that, and uh, uh, he asked me to apply to schools outside of the state of Texas as well as in Texas just to see if I had, uh, you know, what it took to get in. And if I didn't get in, I didn't lose anything. I, you know, I still true. hopefully would go to school in Texas for law school. Um, and, uh, you know, I told him, I don't know if, if it's going to be possible for me, dad. And he just said, just do it for me. Just, just try for me. Just see what happens. This is on me, not on you. I want you to do it. And, uh, um, and, and, and let's see what happens. And, and sure enough, I, I ended up getting into several schools outside the state of Texas. I ended up going to law school up in Boston, which is very far away, very different from mm -hmm. Dallas and Denton, uh, what we're all familiar with. But uh, it was the greatest experience of my life. I met people from all over the country. I met Latinos of all different stripes and si types and sizes, as your opening video said. I had never met anybody who was Hispanic who was not Mexican American until I oh. went to law school, and yeah. and up there we had lots of Puerto Ricanos and Cubanos and 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 Central Americans and we had you know some of us uh, Mexican Americans as well, um, and that was it was the most vibrant Latino community I'd ever been a part of as well uh, in my law school. So I treasure that advice, and I also, I like Andres said just don't. Don't let other people ever tell you what you can or can't do, what you can't do in particular, what you should not do. If you believe in yourself, 
um, and you believe that you've done the work and your record is good, then you put yourself out there and you take a chance. Um, and uh, it's, it could be scary, but the rewards at the end of the, at the, end of the journey are so great that uh, you, you will never regret it. Perfect. I want to lift that up for the students again. So believing in yourself and when you believe in yourself to try something that may be difficult, but try for it anyway. So I think that those are both excellent pieces of advice that we can use our whole lives, not just while you're in school. So thank you. Um, what do you think sets you apart from other people, if somebody was applying for your job right now, the jobs that you both have, what do you think sets you apart from other candidates that brings like a strength to the companies that you work for? Andres, would you like to start? Yeah, absolutely. I think overall, it's just knowing what you can and cannot do, right? I think when we're in a job interview setting is, just being upfront and honest with what you actually bring to the table and what you don't bring to the table. And that that you don't bring to the table, you don't necessarily have to highlight those things, right? You don't necessarily have to highlight them, right? But letting the person know that you're willing to learn, right? And something that I like that Ruby said is that, you know, it's, it's important to always be a lifelong learner. So for whatever skills you think that you lack or you don't bring to the table, right? Always say that you're willing to learn and that you're moldable. And I think that's what an employer is always looking for, right? I don't think an employer is necessarily looking for the top candidate, which at times they are, right? Um, however, they're also looking for someone who they're able to coach, who they're able to train, who they're able to mold, right? Who's flexible. Um, and I think those are important characteristics to bring into the table whenever you are applying for a job, right? Letting the employer know that you are flexible and willing to learn that you're not just stuck in your way of thinking, right? That you're able to uh, obtain new knowledge and wanting to be a continuous learner throughout the process. Mm -hmm. Being flexible is one of the core values of Dallas ISD. It really does come into play every day and being able to accomplish tasks at a high level. And let me tell you, flexibility. it's something that you will need in your careers <laughs> as you guys, you know, for those of you guys that maybe are in high school seeking out your first jobs or what have you, right? It's a skill that you'll have to carry with you the rest of your life, right? So the earlier that you can learn on how to be flexible, how to work with others, right? It's, it's really going to take you a long way once you actually make it into, into the career world. Mm -hmm. Um, Rudy, what would you like to share about what is unique about you, <clears throat> excuse me, or um, even what's unique, what do you look for in others when you're hiring? Well, I, I like to, you know, I think that I'm a very good communicator. I I'm, uh, think I'm a good writer. That's something, you know, that started really in, in uh, I had great English teachers in, in high school uh, and junior high and who really helped me learn how to write. Uh, and I um, also feel very comfortable, you know, around big groups of people and, uh, and, and, and in talking and things like this, um, things that, you know, I've just, I've had a lot of experience with, with public speaking and with um, trying to make myself understood and, and in communicating to large groups of people. But beyond that, I also feel like I have a, a good sense of uh, empathy, a good ability to uh, feel what other people are feeling and look at things from other points of view. I, I try not to be um, rigid in the way that I approach any problem. Uh, I try to hear all sides of the problem and uh, try to arrive at a solution that, it, that works for the most number of people as possible. Um, and I've, you know, everybody has their own experience. Nobody's had their any experience. Nobody in the world shares my experience exactly. Um, and so I think that I bring a set of experience uh, experiences with me that uh, have equipped me to, to lead and to, uh, to, to inspire people and to, uh, to bring results out of people uh, in a way that um, uh, makes them proud and that makes them proud to be part of our team. Mm -hmm. I love that being able 
those, um, we call them soft skills, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to be flexible, being able to be a leader. Those are things that you can't like measure as easily for people, but are super important. Um, we have our first question I'm gonna ask you from um, Anne Frank Elementary School. And this question is, how did the pandemic change your jobs? So, well, it, um, it had a huge impact on us here at, yes. at Chuck E. Cheese and uh, Peter Piper Pizza. Um, you might remember if you tried to go to Chuck E. Cheese last year, we were closed most of the year because, um, uh, because of the pandemic. And we only started to be able to open towards the second half of the year. And in some, some places, because we're all over the country in 47 different states, some places we weren't able to open all year and we only got open the first, the last store, the last restaurant, Chuck E. Cheese that we opened um, that was closed last March, we reopened in June of this year. So it took oh, a very wow. long, Over long a time to get all of the restaurants open. So it changed my job a tremendous amount. We had to focus on the, um, you know, making sure that our employees were safe and healthy uh, and uh, that also they had uh, access to uh, whatever form of financial uh, assistance they needed um, during the time when uh, we were very, we were all very um, uh, frugal with our money because there wasn't a lot of, uh, not a lot of people coming into our restaurants. So we weren't making a lot of money. So we had to be careful. So it, 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 it changed the focus of, our, of, of my job uh, a tremendous amount. Um, uh, we, it, it was all we did for the majority of last year was deal with things relating to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, I know that that was really hard in the restaurant industry worldwide, a lot of changes. And Andres, I know that you say that you're working remotely now. What other changes have happened yeah, so um, as, as you stated earlier, right, I, I work in learning and development, so I kind of merge the two, right, so I work in the finance industry, but kind of merging the educational piece aspect into it, and working in the learning and development side of the business, we had to quickly adapt um, our learning, just like teachers did, right, from a face-to-face -face setting to a virtual environment, mm -hmm. and so as a lot of teachers can attest, right, converting that curriculum into a curriculum that's more engaging and in the virtual environment was pretty complicated, right? It's pretty complicated, especially when you think it uh, from the point of view of trying to teach someone a new job or a new skill, right? Um, it, it's different when you're trying to teach them how to do a job that maybe might be more hands-on, uh, mm -hmm. where it might be more necessary for you to be there interacting with the other person and trying to do that virtually. So trying to come up with creative ways of how to create curriculum that's more virtually engaging, um, not just for the facilitator, but for the participants as well, right? Because at the end of the day, they have to be in a training environment. They have to learn the skills and they have to be ready to go by the time they leave your class, right? And it's like, how can you make a curriculum that's more engaging on an in an online environment and that's that's something that we're still you know that's the, the, we're still working on right it's it's a never ending process i yes. would say at this we're, point we're still doing that too. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no i know educators have gone out of their ways to try and make this as easy and meaningful for students yeah, yeah. well our time has come um, and I know you guys have to get back to work, but thank you so much for speaking to us today. We really appreciate all of your words of wisdom that you've shared with us. And I am going to share who our door prize winners are. So let's see. Ta-da! So these are our door prize winners. You have all won already but we have 10 more winners that if you fill out the survey at the end of the webinar, you will be able to also win a prize. And I'm gonna put the link to that in the chat. You can click on that 
And um, just to remind you that we have another career webinar next week. And everyone who's coming next week works for the same company. They work for Match Group and they own Match.com and Tinder and Our Time, things like that. So they will be here next week. Again, here are door prize winners our feedback survey. And um, thank you for coming. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you, Andres. And thank you, Rudy. And thank you to Maris for being our interpreter. So we hope everyone has a great day and we will see you next week. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, thank you to the cat. <laughs> the mouse. Yes. Thank you. Yes, we haven't had two different animals before so <laughs> i was excited great. <laughs> all right goodbye thank everyone thank you thank you bye-bye